Welcome! The scope of this tutorial is to showcase to students how to use a grasshopper definition to streamline the creation of 3D models from height map data, either for use for CNC milling or laser cutting or any other applicable use. We will be using height map data from the Swedish Surveyors Agency, but the assumption is that any height map data will do. To access the height map data, let's go to a web browser and let's search for Hercules and Sveriges Landbruks Universitet and Geodata Extraction Tool. And here we have it. Let's log in with your KTH account credentials. Having authorized access to the service, let's zoom in here with the scroll wheel to our point of interest. Loading the raster map data might take a while, so be patient. And then we can draw here and we'll draw a rectangle. And the crop rectangle here should be fairly generous with regards to what we aim to include in the intended model, so that we don't need to backtrack and go back to this initial stage to download again. So let's perhaps do it like this, and then we can go to the second tab here and select data, and here I think it's easiest if we control F to find, and then it is the terrain model. And there is only one option for the terrain model, it has a resolution of one meter per pixel. Let's add it to order and go to the third tab here, agree to the terms and go. Very good. The link to download a file will be emailed to you. So check your email and it might take a while. Here we have it, just click the link and it will be downloaded. And since fairly recently, the previously intelligible name of the archive has been replaced with something much more random. So it might be advisable that the first thing you do is go back to the select data tab here and then you can perhaps, without the colon there, and then you can copy this, and then you can rename this archive to something more intelligible, and then you can, with 7-zip, you can extract it to such a folder, and you can delete the archive, and this folder will move to our project folder, like that, we can open this one, and we find here that we have two height maps included in the archive. Very good. We can open QGIS, and then we can make sure that this is active, and then we can just click and drag these two TIFF files, those are GeoTIFF files, into the layer pane here, and the project coordinate reference system will automatically be adjusted to the one that we imported here in an empty project, that's good to know. So now we have SWIREF 99TM. As of now, if we zoom in here a little, we see that as a seam, these two individual files are being rendered with uh, respective uh, ranges in heights. So let's make sure that we first merge these. And it's easy as this. Go to raster, miscellaneous and merge. Make sure to go to the input layers here and select both of these. You could also select all. Then go back. Make sure that the output data type is still the input float 32 bit. And then we should save this to a saved file. And we can do a second folder here to make it more clear. Custom layers 01. This file is then the merged file. Very good. And then we can run. And it is merged. We can close. And then we can hide the previously imported one. They can still be here referenced. Now, so as to be able to make a more accurate crop here, it is easiest if you go down here in the browser and you just click and drag OpenStreetMap. It can be dragged into in the layer pane or directly here. And then we can go to our focal point here and position ourselves at a suitable zoom-in level. And then we should create a crop layer. So we go to Layer and Create Layer. We create a new shapefile layer. And the file name, this should be saved. It can be in our Custom Layers folder here. The name can be Crop. The geometry type should be polygon in this case. We'll change the coordinate reference system to the project one. And then we can press OK. And now we'll toggle editing mode for this newly created layer. And we'll add a new geometry. And the geometry that we add is going to be this one. A rectangle from center and a point. That makes it easy to select a focal point and then adjust how much of an area from that point that should be included. So perhaps something like this. We'll right mouse button click, and then we don't need an ID. And then we'll click this button to toggle editing mode, and we'll save the changes. And now we can double click on the crop layer here, and we can change the opacity to perhaps 30%. And green on green is not very visible, but we can still see it. It's okay, because now we'll hide the OpenStreetMap, and we'll see that it is this area that we are interested in. So as to crop this merged layer, we can simply right mouse when I click on it and do export and save as. And then we'll make sure that the output mode is the raw data. We still want the floating 32-bit data. We'll choose a relevant file name. We'll save it in the correct directory. And then we can save it as cropped. 
and the coordinate reference system is correct and then the actual extents will calculate from a layer and we'll use the extents of our crop layer and this will of course be very exact with decimal values since the pixel resolution is one pixel per meter for the layer that we're going to save, we want to make sure that we only have integer values here. So we can do a rounding to a ceiling with this to four. The north and east are both extended positively and the west and south extends negatively. So we'll do east, we can do a ceiling here to five. And the south, we can do a floor to eight. And west, we can do a floor to eight as well. Very good. So now we see here that with a resolution of one meter per pixel, we'll get an even 487 times 386 resolution. Very good. Now we can press OK to save it. And now we can actually hide the previously merged layer. And we can also hide the crop layer. And here we have our new crop. We should save this project file if something goes over in the next steps. And here we'll make sure to double click this crop layer. And in the Symbology tab, we'll expand the min and max value settings and make sure that this accuracy setting is set to actual slower. We can apply this and then we can go to the Information tab. And if we scroll down here to the Information from Provider segment, we can actually copy all of this data. So Control C and then we can open a text editor and we can paste it here. Very good. And we'll go back to QGIS. Now, already at this stage, we can actually use the graspable definition to determine whether we want a more restricted 8-bit value range data or if we want the extended value range of 16-bit data. So we can start Rhino and we can start Grasshopper. We'll open the aforementioned Grasshopper definition. So let's just click and drag this to open this here. So here, for the first part, we can actually decide whether we want 8-bit data or 16-bit data. 8-bit data is really, really easy to procure and 16-bit data is a little more complex. So we can go to the copy data and then we can input 33.2. We can copy this and paste it here. And we'll do the minimum. It's 88. We can do like this or we can do 0 0.88 by hand manually. If there's a minus sign here, make sure to include it. So now we see that the height range here is actually only 32.32 meters. If we do not use an extended value range, then the actual height difference in meters between the 256 discrete vertical steps with the 8-bit value range is actually not much more than a tenth of a meter. If we would have a certain fabrication scale in mind, perhaps 1 to 500, then this would amount to 0.25 millimeters per each discrete vertical step as for the vertical resolution of the input data. This would be a scenario where 8-bit data would be totally acceptable. But if we would have a much higher height here, let's input 182. So if we would have a height range of about 181 meters with an 8-bit value range then with the fabrication scale of 1 to 500, each individual vertical step would be 1.4 millimeters. And if our aim would have been a terraced model with 1 millimeter per each terrace step or height curve, then the 8 bits value range would be far too restricted for that. If we would have used the extended value range of 16 bit data, then that same value would be approximately 1 200th of a millimeter which would be undiscernible to die. We'll briefly showcase how to export 8-bit data since it's so easy and then we'll continue with the 16-bit data. We'll go back to QGIS. To save 8-bit data it's really easy. Just go to export, save as and then change raw data to rendered image. And this, then this one can be saved as cropped 8 bits. Corner reference system is correct and we don't need to change the crop. Okay. As of this tutorial situation, we can hide this and proceed with the 16-bit data workflow. Before converting this 32-bit float data to 16-bit data, which can be used as input for a height field in Rhino, we'll have to remap the range to the full 16-bit color value range. We do this here in the processing toolbox. If you don't have it, click processing and toolbox. And then you can go to raster analysis and open by double-clicking the raster calculator. Here we'll make sure to reference the input layer that is relevant, the cropped one here, and then we'll go back. The expression is not that complex. We'll copy it from here and input it here. 
it is also stated in the description. We'll need to make sure that this name is the same as the layer name. If you have any other layer name, make sure that this corresponds with what you have chosen as for the layer name. And then we'll simply open our previously copied data here and we can copy the statistics minimum first. So we'll just copy this value here and then we'll exchange all of the statistics minimum with precisely that. So these two. And then we'll do the same for the statistics maximum. We'll make sure that this is saved to an actual file. This can be called cropped, remapped, and then we run it. Great, we can close this. And you see here that it has the full range of the 16-bit value range. What we do now is to minimize this and then we'll go down to GDAL and then it's raster conversion and we can double click here on translate. And we'll make sure that it's cropped, remapped, that it's selected. Very good. Here it is important that we change the output data type from use input layer data type to unsigned integer 16-bit value range. Very good. And we'll also make sure to save this to an actual file. So this can be cropped, remapped, 16-bit. And then we'll run this. And you will most probably get a warning here, warning that the values closest to zero will have been shifted and clamped. It's a minor drawback of this workflow if we click close here and if we double click here so as to make sure in the symbology tab that these are the actual values, we'll press OK. Then we can see here 20 is the new minimum. If we do 20 divided by 65,535, we'll see here that during the conversion we lost the precision comparable to approximately one third of a millimeter, which is not liable. So we can go back to QGIS and here we can actually just save this project and then we can close QGIS, this file already having been saved. This is the file that we are going to use as input for a height field in Rhino. So we'll open Rhino here and we can double click here to minimize this to the window bar. And the first thing we'll need to make sure is that we work in meters. So let's change the unit settings and work in meters as active units. Very good. And then we input the command height field. Let's choose the remap 16-bit data here and open this. Rhino will ask you for the first corner. So let's go back to our copied reference data here. And the first corner is the first value of the extents here. So we'll copy this. And then personally, I find it's easiest to just right mouse and click here and paste. So there we have it. And then it's the second corner or length. And then I find it's easiest to do the length here or the width actually says here. So we'll copy this and we can right mouse and click and paste. Very good. The number of sample points, you are free to choose the resolution of the interpolated surface. But generally, there is not much to gain to exceed the actual resolution of the input data. So we'll go back here to our reference data here and we see that we have, since it's one meter per pixel, we have 487 times 386. So 487 times 386. The height here is stated as 77.39 meters. We should of course change this so as to reflect our actual height range. So we can actually then expand Grasshopper here and we have already calculated the range here from the difference of these two. So we can simply right mouse and click here and copy data only. And we can double click on the window bar there as well. We can control A to select everything and then paste. Very good. So now it says here 32.32 meters. This might be a little finicky. Sometimes this changes the value back again to the previously set one. Make sure that it is the correct one before you press OK. We want to make sure to select the third option here to create an interpolated surface where each sample is at the correct height. The control point surface will not be accurate and the mesh surface will be hard to manipulate afterwards, in Rhino at least. We'll press OK here. And here, since this is the first thing that we do in the model, we don't need to save the model before proceeding. So we'll click No here, and then we'll allow it to process. Having generated the height field, we can do Control a to select everything, and then ZS to zoom to selected. And we can do that in all viewports, zoom to selected in all viewports. But we can actually just maximize perspective by double clicking on it. The first thing we should do is to actually do a bounding box, so as to make sure that we have the correct height range here. Very good. We can undo that command. Now, when the height field was generated, it, the lowest point is actually at zero in the z-axis, and we should make sure that it is correct. So let's go back to our reference data here, and we see that the statistic minimum is actually 0 0.88. So let's make sure that we move this up 0 0.88 meters. Very good. We can click in the void here to deselect. Sometimes the density of the isocurves might make it a little 
difficult to orient yourself in the model, then changing to perhaps the Arctic display mode might be recommendable. Then to make a final crop here, we can actually make a rectangle and then do it arbitrarily. And then we can sell last to select it. And then we can click and drag the blue circle here so as to extrude it upwards. We can actually delete that rectangle. And now we can move everything down a little like this. And now with this ceilingless extrusion, it might be easier to actually refine the final crop. So perhaps we want that road there. And perhaps let's see if we expand this a bit like this so that we get the peak there. And we can actually constrain that axis a little more and move it towards here. We don't need to extend it as far as that, so we can constrain this axis a little. Remembering that our focal point is in the actual center of the original crop, but something like this might be good. We can order the relatively few objects that we have here into layers. So we have a height field and we also have a crop and we have walls and we want to have a rectangle as our final crop input. Yeah, so we'll make that rectangle, the crop looks good. So the extrusion, the walls here, we can change to that layer and hide it. The rectangle, we can assign to its appropriate layer as well, as well as the height field. We should save this file as well. Going back to the shaded view mode here and moving a little like that. Then we can open the grasshopper window here again by double clicking. And then we can go to the next segment here where it says that we choose a singular closed curve as a crop. And this should be this one. So with it selected in the Rhino viewport, we can right mouse from the click on the curve node here and we can do set multiple curves even though only one is selected. It's okay. Very good. And then we'll select the height field and we'll do the same here. And then we can click in the void. So the grasshopper definition, it processes the data in several stages so as to make sure that no individual stage takes too long. So we can make sure that having referenced these correctly, we can save the grasshopper file here. And we already know that the last thing we did here in the Rhino viewport was actually saving the file. So we can push play on this button. And then just checking if we can zoom in and out. That's fairly non-intrusive instead of like clicking and dragging. We see that it is already done here. The splitting of the height field with the crop curve took almost a second but might take longer for larger inputs and then we'll make sure here that the fabrication scale of the model is correct we have 1 to 500 here as a default value we can do 1 to 800 or we can do 1 to 200 or we can simply do the default of 1 to 500 that's okay if one would want to use this definition for cnc fabrication then we always want to have a bottom margin or a height of base in millimeter with regards to the fabrication scale it should be minimum four millimeters but you can customize this here so perhaps do 12 then we see here stage two, we should push play here. And you are very welcome to delve into all the inner workings of the grasshopper definition. We will now focus on, on actually just using it. So as you might see here, it might be a little difficult to see with all of the overlaying geometry here. If we bake this and select it here, the poly surface, and then we can just haphazardly and arbitrarily move it out here. We see that we have a smooth landscape model here. It is still scaled 1 to 1, but if we do scale it with a factor of 1 to 500 and then zoom in here, then we see that we have approximately the 12 millimeters of bottom margin as we previously set, so that's very good. Before using this for CNC fabrication, always make sure to change the active unit to millimeters and move it closer to the origin. In this case, we can just undo and undo, and we actually don't need this, so we can simply delete it. Having made sure to properly run this part of the definition, we want to make sure that we specify a material layer thickness here. As the default value is set to four, perhaps we want to use another, perhaps one millimeter cardboard or two millimeter cardboard. We can do two millimeter cardboard, and the fabrication scale is set as previously here. Having set the material layer thickness, we can push play here. Depending on the size and complexity of the model, this might take longer or shorter. This took a little more than half a minute. And you can also customize the threshold for sorting out small surfaces from the terrace model here. And we see here that in a scale of 1 to 500 and with a layer height or a material, material thickness of 2 millimeters, we would need 23 layers for a terrace model here. A terrace model could of course also be CNC milled and then the material layers are of course not relevant. And we can bake this. And since these are multiple geometries, we want to group these. And we can type select last to select the recently generated geometry here. 
We can double click here on the window bar to minimize it and we can move this out arbitrarily. And here we see a bug in the definition as it currently stands. Let's control shift G to ungroup this. And here we see that this layer is actually too much below. So we'll move this up to there like that. Very good. It is not the scope of this tutorial to showcase how one would do descended footprints for a laser cuttable model like this, but we can do, let's do one box here and then we can take from this point and then we can do like this and move it upwards arbitrarily and then we can move it a little outside like this perhaps. That's okay. And then we can do, then we can select all of these. These were previously grouped, but we can make sure to regroup these by selecting all and then deselecting with control clicking that one and group. And now we can do Boolean difference with this one. And we can actually delete this or hide it. So now we see that we have made such a manipulation there. Now to make laser cuttable vectors from this input, we should actually first make sure to export this. So let's do export. I should be exported as a Rhino model. Let's save this. And then before opening this exported file, we can actually save this file as well. And then we'll simply go to the exported file here and open that one. Here we have it. What we need to do now is to make sure that this is situated close to the origin. So moving to the origin, having moved it to the origin, we should change the units from meter to millimeter. And we should accept the rescaling and then we should scale from the origin with a scale factor of 1 to 500. Very good. And then we can open the grasshopper definition again. And then we should reference this model here. We can temporarily hide those by making sure that only the selected nodes are viewed like that. And then we see here if we go first to the right, we see the curves here and they are distributed very unoptimized. You will have to do the optimization yourself. Let's bake this. And we don't need to group this. So one example of optimization might be to position geometry like this where they can fit. Yeah, you understand the gist of it. The lowest layer is at the bottom here and then along the positive y-axis it progresses upwards. The laser cutters at KTA School of Architecture, we can do a rectangle here. They have a work bed area of 960 times 609. So you can essentially just position these and then you can fit into these as many as you can. Let's make sure that we are in top view, zoom to extents, and then we can do like this. And we can rotate this 90 degrees. Yeah, you understand. And when you have prepared these sheets, you can just select them, make sure that they are relatively close to the origin, and then you can just export and you can export it immediately as an illustrator file. And you should preserve model scale, one millimeter equals one millimeter, and you can press okay, and save, and okay. <laughs> that concludes this tutorial, showcasing how to use a grasshopper definition to more efficiently create 3D models, both smooth and terrace models for CNC milling or laser cutting, or any other applicable use. One final note should be that there is one singular node that relies on an extension being installed called Human. The extension is supplied on the website Food for Rhino, where you can download it if you are logged in. You can either create an account on Food for Rhino, but it might also be of interest that on the website bugmenot.com you can simply copy and paste this without the superfluous information there and enter and you can find username and passwords which are being shared if you just need to download it fairly quickly and don't want to create your own account. For Rhino 7 and Rhino 8 there is a McNeil discourse thread here highlighting how to download and how to install for more recent Rhino releases. Thank you for your time.